Hey, everybody. I'm Chris Charbonneau, associate publisher for Spin, or excuse me, for Fish Talk Magazine. Sorry. Miss we'll Tootie Magazine. Too, I guess. Oh, geez. That's not really the way I wanted to start it. But hey, um, we are back on on a brand, brand new platform. Um, we, uh, we apologize for the terrible technical difficulties that we encountered on uh, um, last week on Thursday. Um, but uh, very happy that uh, you could join us today. Um, it's uh, going to be a great show. It was going to be a great show on Thursday, but it's going to be a better show today. Um, Lenny, how are you doing? Good, good. And I want to apologize too. You know, folks, we went a solid 25 minutes trying to get it going, and we just kept getting the same message over and over again. The server is busy. Please try again. The server is busy. Please try again. And it was just like, come on. We're trying to talk fish in here. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, we're back. Uh, I am in a new setting. I'm sorry. I know everybody really grew, grew accustomed to seeing the inside of my living room. Um, but uh, I'm actually back in the office now to do to do these things. Um, and uh, it's all right. It's nice being back, I guess. Now I'm you know, back in my office too, you know? Yes. That looks much more comfortable than mine. And nothing's changed here. <laughs> well, cool. Lenny, what are we talking about today? Well, we're going to do a couple things tonight. First, we're going to do a rockfish update. Uh, as we get into it, I'm going to say, folks, you know, normally I say throw up your questions. We'll answer them as they come. We actually have a special guest tonight. Dave Sikorsky yes. from the Coastal Conservation Association will be with us. And um, so we're going to we're going to handle the questions a little differently, probably, because we'll be juggling multiple people here. But please, by all means, go into the comments and put those questions in. And sooner or later, we will get them answered. So, Chris, why don't we go ahead to slide number one here? Uh, all right. Uh, I, again, forgive the technical difficulties. because uh, <laughs> Yeah, we're trying always, something new here. Exactly. But, Hopefully we can get slide number one up. And right. uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna disappear. Whoop, whoop, bye Chris. Oh, here we go. Okay, so there's Mark with a darn nice rockfish. That's an upper bay rockfish. Um, and of course, uh, now that the 19s are in, most people are downsizing their baits. They're going from the eight and nine inch stuff down to the six and five inch stuff. And uh, he didn't do that and he caught that fish. Now that was that was a week ago. This was last week's slide. But the interesting thing is there's still a fair number of fish of this size being caught. Uh, the trophy season was, you know, like everybody knows, pretty darn slow. In fact, we did a survey among our readers on Facebook, and I asked people just to chime in and let us know on opening weekend each day if they caught a fish, and if so, how many. And that was it. That was all the information we wanted. Uh, pretty interesting. Through the course of the weekend, what we found were 18 respondents uh, caught two or more trophy fish. 44 respondents caught one trophy fish. And 113 caught nothing. Goose egg. And many of those were both Saturday and Sunday. So if you've been going out, if you've been having trouble finding a big fish... <laughs> Don't feel bad about it. There just haven't been that many around. But what's interesting here, again, is that there are still a few popping up. Normally, at this time of year, we expect that it'll be gone. I'm sure most of them are. But if you want to put out the big stuff and try for them, hey, there's still a few out there. Chris, could you go ahead and take us to the next slide, please? So here we have uh, a, another trophy that was caught. This one, this one was about two weeks ago. Uh, but this is uh, from Jeff Sykes sent us in this picture. He's a really good troller. Uh, he's been catching some fish. So th those big ones, they are out there. Chris, go ahead and take me to the next slide, please. One consistent thing that we've been hearing from everybody, and I mean everybody, this is across the board probably more so than I can ever remember, white. White, 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 white. Every now and again you hear about someone catching on a chartreuse, but the white parachutes and shad have been catching the vast majority of the fish. And interestingly, I've been hearing about more tandem rigs catching than umbrellas. Normally, it's sort of a, a mix, tandems and umbrellas, tandems and umbrellas. That's still true, but more and more, it's been tandems. It's been white tandems. All right, Chris, go ahead and take us to the next slide, would you please? Well, well we skipped one. Okay, there we go. 
So this was last week's slide to show folks the areas that had been hot. At, well, we lost the slide, Chris. We lost the slide. It's gone. There we go. Now the slide's back. Thank you. <laughs> so above the bridge, the love point zone to the dumping grounds was kind of the hot zone. Uh, where the ships anchor up off the Severn uh, was, a, was a good zone. Uh, off Bloody Point and then again off Poplar Island. This has pretty much remained true in the in the last week. I think I've heard of more fish at the mouth of the chop tank. Early on, we really weren't hearing about that much. Um, but what's interesting is with the 19 inches coming in, I've been running out and doing, <clears throat> excuse me, doing some after work trips, evening trips. And last week, uh, there were hordes of fish on the shallow water structure spots, uh, Thomas Point. Thomas Point Lighthouse, the mouth of the West, your usual suspects, plenty of fish. Now, over the weekend, I'm guessing we had an algae bloom. We certainly haven't had any rain. The water quality on the western side really trended down. It's It's been pretty icky in the last few times I've been out. And uh, the fish pretty much disappeared. I was out Sunday evening, and on the western side, uh, you know, we caught a handful of dinks. It was really tough going. Now, my son David went over the eastern side. They fished around Poplar. They fished some other shallow water zones. They had clear water and a good solid bite. So, and they got fish up into the mid 20s, throwing jigs in the shallows. Chris, bring me back on screen here, would you please? <clears throat> so, across the board uh, in the shallows, pretty much wherever you're at, this is what's been hot for me. So we got about a, what's that, a, a half ounce head there, um, a chartreuse skirt, and a white paddle tail. That's been the ticket for me. That's what's really been catching. And when I go out, I normally have, you know, three, four people on board. Everybody gets something different, and then we kind of hone down to the hot bait. And uh, that, that's that been it. That's what has been working. I believe Dave, when he caught his fish, he was using a white BKD, uh, again, skirted. Not sure if he had a short truce. Uh, I forgot to ask him that. But uh, in any case, again, it's it's the white the white baits are just they're kicking it. Chris, go ahead and put up that next slide, would you please? So uh, that is one fat catfish, <laughs> right? Uh, that's a Sandy Point. Uh, guys fishing off Sandy Point continue to catch catfish like this. Guys who have been chumming north of the bridge hoping to get into the 19 to mid 20 inch rockfish. Um, from all reports, they are getting a few of those fish, but if the bait goes down to the bottom, this is what they're catching. There, there's a lot of catfish still roaming around north of the bridge. Uh, Padickery Point has been a good area. I, I think it's probably been maybe, I didn't crunch the numbers, but probably something around a three to one ratio of catfish to rockfish. Most of the guys I'm hearing from are catching, you know, four, five, six throwbacks and a keeper or two, something along those lines. Uh, the guys up north will be happy to hear that we recently got in some reports. I mean, recently is in the last day or two from the flats. Uh, guys live lining white perch are catching good numbers of keeper fish. Uh, um, in fact, the uh, uh, I heard from the ghost drag guy. Oh, God, I'm blanking on his name. Please forgive me. Uh, but anyway. He was live lining uh, white perch and, and with three on board had his limit by 10 o'clock. So the flats are holding some fish. Uh, go ahead and take us to the next slide, would you please, Chris? So here we have a snakehead, uh, again, up north, Haber de Grace, up to uh, into the Susquehanna, the flats, the dam pool. Where constant reports are coming in on the snakeheads. Also getting a lot of snakehead reports from up the Rappahannock uh, for you guys down south. That's been a good bite down there, too. And, you know, before we get totally off the rockfish, I want to mention uh, there have been some uh, slot fish down there. Of course, they're in Virginia now. Uh, and we've also been getting some pretty darn good reports of specks uh, from the Pianca tank, the Gwynn Island area. And interestingly, a fair number of keeper flounder from that zone, too. We're also hearing about keeper flounder coming in from the Tangier. So could this be the year the flounder come back? We'll have to cross our fingers and hope, but, um, I, you know, in the last, I, I'll bet it's been five, 10 years since I've heard about flounder fishing like I'm hearing about right now from those areas. So this early in the season, that's very cool. That could lead to something. But let's get back to the snakehead here. 
Uh, snakehead, of course, is an invasive species. The blue cats that are popping up are an invasive species. And uh, that's why we wanted to rope Dave Sikorsky into this conversation. Chris, can we get Dave in here? Hey, there he is. What's happening, Dave? How you doing, Lenny? Good to see you. I'm doing good. Good to see you, too. Do you like fishing for snakeheads and blue cats? I sure do, and I wish I got to do it as much as the participants in the Great Chesapeake Invasive Scout because I'm seeing tons of great fish being reported through our, our program, our, our activity, our, our event. Uh, our citizen science event, and uh, I'm just jealous. Now, I, I, I'm i in the great invasive species count, of mm -hmm. course. Yep. And uh, I've taken some uh, blue cats and snakeheads and sent you the pictures. And uh, But I didn't win a prize last week. I was bummed because we had some really cool prizes. Yeah. There were, there were gift certificates to the Wolford store, which, side note, has the best cheesesteaks on the face of the planet. <laughs> and I was sitting there watching as the prizes were getting picked, like, please, let me win. I want to go get some of those cheesesteaks. <laughs> I'll tell you what, yeah, and they also have, if you're lucky when you get down there, they may have fresh snakehead as well. So the fried snakehead basket, the French fries, they're, they're uh, the last thing. I want to say I, I went down there for a podcast at some point in the fall, and that's the uh, the last meal I had at Wolford's store was that. So nice. It was good. It's nice. classic fried fish. And, uh, you know, the team down there at Blackwater's Edge are such such great guys, so focused on the snakehead and yeah. the impact they're having on their local ecosystem. and. We're happy to be supporting some of their stuff and glad to have, you know, the invasives count out there for lots of people to use to, uh, you know, share what, what you're seeing on the water, provide it to Maryland DNR. Um, and if you log your catch, you get a chance to win prizes like you're talking about. Um, well, wh why don't you give everyone a rundown on what exactly the great invasives uh, sure. count is? Because some folks out there probably don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So CCA MD, there it is. Look at that. It's like you read my mind, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, CCA MD.org slash count is where you can find uh, the webpage that uh, tells you all the information on there. And it's a it's free. So it's free to participate. Uh, you you sign up. Uh, it, it tells you how to log, uh, download the iAngler tournament uh, smartphone app. So you can take pictures of your catch against a ruler. Um, and what we're looking to do is log the length of the fish that you catch, um, the snakeheads, uh, blue catfish and and, and uh, flathead catfish. So the two invasive catfishes and then the snakehead are the ones we're looking to, to capture more data on. And so we do this for Maryland DNR in the spirit of citizen science, um, really capturing this data. We're not exactly sure what it's going to tell us. We're going to leave that to the professionals, but um, it's a good way for anglers to report what they're catching, where they're catching it. Uh, we ask for the general water body uh, to be uh, provided in order for folks to, to be entered for the prizes. Um, so you download the app, you sign up for free, um, and then when you go fishing, you take a picture of your catch. Um, and again, length, weight, stomach contents, all that information is on the website. Um, and then another thing we're looking for folks to do is help and be a promotional partner. And so Blackwater's Edge and uh, Wolford Store was our first promotional partner uh, for the month of um, April. We just did our drawings at the end of April. Um, and there were 10 prizes, 10 $25 gift cards, like you mentioned. Um, and then we do five of them for people, for anybody. It's a general member. Your name goes in the hat in the month that you register. So if you aren't registered yet, register before May is over and you're in the May bucket or, or hat um, for drawings. And then for each fish you log that has location plus length, location plus weight, or location plus stomach contents equals another entry into the, the raffle. Um, so... The end of this month, we'll be pulling uh, prizes from um, Island Tackle Outfitters. Uh, they're on Kent Island. So mm -hmm. again, ten twenty-five dollar gift cards, and um, CCA actually adds in some prizes. Um, I've got a box right here, getting ready to be shipped out to uh, one of our participants, Chad Rice from uh, from April. So he uh, he got drawn twice. He got, he picked a, two different Sim CCA hats we have. So these will be up available for five people that are CCA members every single month we also have a ruler in here and uh i've got a few little surprises up my sleeve too uh um actually a fillet knife uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> knife sharpeners. surprise yeah uh, the sheath is on the sheath is on so no cuts um knife sharpeners some some other cool stuff and um again we're just rewarding people for taking the extra time to log their catch to provide this data to dnr um and the promotional partner piece um you, you folks go to the page and check it out it also is look we're, we're a big community uh, there's a lot of debate about these spe these species. What is invasive? What is not? Are they good? Are they bad? Et cetera. You know, natural resource policy is always going to be a difficult thing to, to find agreement and consensus, but science is so important. So we're here to support the science and we'll let the professionals kind of sort it out moving forward. And, 
you know, everybody will get a, a chance to weigh in on some of these measures if and when Maryland DNR uh, decides to manage these fish differently. Um, but for now, the rules are what they are. Um, and we're all about, you know, sharing what we have in common and respectfully uh, debating what the future may hold for these um, these fish. I, I think they're here to stay. So uh, there's lots of ways to utilize them. Well, so I got I got two questions, Dave, coming to, coming to my mind about yep. the cat here. The first is, let's say I catch a snakehead, right? Yep. And I'm going to take it home and eat it because I like snakehead. They are tasty fish. So I take a picture of it on the ruler. I do it in the iAngler app, which, by the way, folks, is just a total piece of cake. Even I figured it out in, like, no time flat. It's, like, super easy. I, I think you may have texted me for tech support at least once. Oh, I, might, I might have. I might have. Yeah. Okay. The tech support is there. He's right there. I'm right here. Yep. That's <laughs> so, what the ding was on my phone. <laughs> so so I take the picture of the snakehead. I send it to you, and I get one, one ticket in the bucket to win a prize, yep. right? Yep. yep. Now, I got the fish. And I take a picture of the stomach contents so that the biologists know what this fish is eating. And yep. that's valuable information, of course, right? Uh, do I get another ticket in the prize bucket? Yep. I do. So that's two tickets in the prize bucket. Now, Chris, is there a way to get up the next slide with me and Dave? Can we do that? I know I'm asking a lot here. We're pushing the technical boundaries. <laughs> but it might be doable. I've never been on this side of this platform. I know it's it's you know the one we use as well, and it's there it is. Oh, we got it. Okay, so cat. this this right here is Kaylee Jasinski, Prop Talks editor. She was on our Fish for a Cure team, and you probably remember from our Fish for a Cure experience, we caught a lot of blue cats. Yes. Yeah, we went for the invasive species uh, prize, and I think it was something like eight hundred and sixteen inches of blue cats we ended up catching. I forget the exact number, but it was like 50 catfish. So, and and this, as you can see, the bridge piling there, this is a bridge right by the Lincoln Memorial. This was in the Potomac right in DC. So what I'm wondering now is, let's say I really want that $25 gift certificate to, to Island Tackle Outfitters. Mm -hmm. I could use that, right? If so, I go fishing on the Potomac mm -hmm. and I catch 50 blue cats, can I enter all 50 and get 50 shots? You absolutely can. And if they're caught in the same general location, you could log all 50 of them at once. Um, that's something oh. relatively new uh, in my experience with iAngler. It's always been there, but I've never used it um, in our fishing tournaments. But in this platform, folks can enter as many fish as possible um, within the app. I think there may be some limits, but um, ultimately you can do that. And it just creates this big chunk of the data set. And, uh, you know, that's important. Uh, all I will say is it's just going to require more clicks of the mouse from me. So maybe I'll get some carpal tunnel or something for, <laughs> from your blue cat adventure. But, you know, there's especially this size fish that Kaylee's holding. I think these are great eaters, uh, you know, great size fish, a great a fun fight. Um, you know, I think folks are finding out that, of course, bait fishing is, is great. But um, blue cats are different than some of the other um, native mm -hmm. catfish that we have, I think, uh, in that they're a little more uh, aggressive. Uh, chasing down fish. They, they have a very broad diet. I've seen some interesting stomach contents of, um, of shellfish shells ground up, you know, hunks of fin fish. Um, just saw one just now about um, uh, snakehead with juvenile crappie and and, um, and perch in them. So you know, that's the kind of neat stuff we're, we're seeing. And uh, I want folks to be aware that that scientists know, and, and it's been the observation of anglers, that a lot of times these fish have empty stomachs. Um, and to me, that makes sense. Um, as strong predators, they, they have really strong stomach acid, I guess, uh, to, to process their, their food. And so I think to me, it just makes sense that if they're biting your lure, biting your bait, they're probably hungry. They might have an empty mm -hmm. stomach. So don't be surprised if you see an empty, empty stomach and re you can report that. That counts. Um, we've also had folks uh, report fish that are not blue cats, not flatheads, um, channels or, or white bullheads. Um, and that's perfectly fine too. You know, we're in this to learn. Um, there's no need. To, you took the effort to report that catch. We appreciate that. So, uh, if folks go through and look at the pictures and stuff and see them, you know, those fish that are not blue cats, not flatheads, that's okay. You know, it's not the point. We don't want you to keep repeating, you know, supporting, or I'm sorry, reporting um, channel catfish necessarily. But um, you do it every once in a while. You'll get a note from me. Hey, we think this one is, you know, the so and so. Thanks. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, and, and the, I think I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. In our 10 slot drawing, the most somebody can win is two prizes. And so, we actually had that happen uh, twice. So Chad uh, won two prizes. He got two gift cards and those two hats. Uh, and then a young man named uh, Nathan um, or Nate uh, down in Solomon's uh, young teenager just loves fishing. And um, he's been 
putting in a lot of blue cats look just like that one right there. And uh, he won two prizes. So that's a pretty nice haul. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, so Chris, go ahead and take us to the next slide. Let's let's shuffle to our other favorite invasives here. There's a snakehead. Oh yeah. And I wanted to put this picture up for a very particular reason. This is my neighbor Vadim. We went fishing just it was like two weeks ago, and this was in Jug Bay, uh, off the Patuxent. Now, in the last week, I've also gotten picture verified reports from the Magathy, the South, and the West River all three and actually one in the magathy we just got the picture the other day this will be in this week's uh report so that picture will be in there a five-year-old five-year-old caught an eight pound 12 ounce snakehead that's in great. The magathy. so extremely cool stuff yeah. but my whole point here is even if you're not necessarily like a snakehead sharpie or like always going for the blue cats you might want to register for the invasives count. Mm -hmm. You get your name in the hat right away. You might win a prize. And if you catch a fish like this, boom, take a picture. You're good to go. And, um, you know, I, as you mentioned, there's a lot of controversy over these fisheries. There really is. But as you said, these fish are here to stay. Mm -hmm. We might as well make the best of it and enjoy it. And when you get into some places, like Jug Bay is a great example uh, the vast majority of the territory there is very shallow. You got these pads everywhere. It's not a habitat where you have a whole lot of options as far as fisheries go. And the snakehead actually creates a new one. It does. Yeah, absolutely. And same thing, not the same thing, but um, it, well, the snakehead are going to have an impact on the native species. I understand what you're saying that there's probably not a high abundance of them that, that fishermen typically pursue. Um, you know, I was talking to a good friend who's a fully immersed uh, fish nerd. Folks may know Dave McCullum, uh, you know, just a Susquehanna River rat, right? We were talking about what he's experiencing in the Upper Bay because, man, he he reported so many fish last year, uh, got, got a lot of the prizes. Um, and Dave and I were talking about the things that we as anglers don't really think about, um, but will definitely um, – impact our success or or what we want to see in the future almost accidentally um you know folks are, are releasing snakeheads all over the place it's still happening um i've talked about it a lot in the last couple of weeks i think it's ridiculous and disrespectful and selfish but uh, people have done it um it is what it is nobody's a saint um but bottom line is i was talking to dave i said think about like the the log perch you know, the tiny little might as well be a minnow that, that everybody's been concerned about because it's a, you know, I think they consider it a keystone species actually in some of the streams in the upper bay and they're not around in the abundance that we want. A lot of other uh, animals, you know, out there in the system don't really matter to us. They relate to the things we care about. And, you know, I'll throw one thing out there as we consider all the, the issues with striped bass. We don't really know if how much snakeheads and blue cats overlapping with juvenile striped bass uh, habitat is going to affect the the recruitment of these fish and i'll tell you the management plan already swung and missed pretty darn bad in the last few last decade i'd hate to think that we make assumptions moving forward to try and get this fishery back on track and we completely swing and a miss swing and miss again because we don't understand the impact of these fish so you know i i know they're you know everything eats itself eats each other at different stages of their life out there in the aquatic ecosystem but uh i think that's something we should be concerned about and you know one one good way to uh maybe maybe dampen some of the population of these fishes to eat them <laughs> well you know with all these blue cats and snakes popping up in areas like the susquehanna flats you do have to ask yourself you know what's going to happen when all those little itty bitty baby rockfish try and swim out of the river after they hatch and go down the bay you just yep. gotta wonder yep. so uh i want to press pause for just a second here because i can see there's a number of comments mm -hmm. but i can't read them and chris I want you to chime in if we have any questions we should be addressing at this point. And folks, you got questions for me, you got questions for Dave, whatever, just pitch them on out there. So I, I see one. I was Chris going to bring, you can bring questions over, Chris, or I oh. see one from, from Zach. I saw Chris come and go. He disappeared. You can't yeah, see really. See, I'm here. But I every time I talk, you guys can't hear me. So uh, when I'm not on screen, so uh, so I'm going to bring on the questions, and I'll start with the Zach question because we know Zach. That's right. So, oh wow, that's a toughie. It is. Right? Is thirty inch the cutoff where you don't want to eat them beyond? Is it is it thirty or? I think it's going to depend um, where the fish are. 
but yeah, you can always bet on a certain size. Um, fish is going to have, um, a higher prevalence of, of toxins or things you don't want to eat in their meat. And, um, I've actually been involved with some great conversations with a lot of folks from, from all, all different avenue or angles of this blue cat, uh, discussion from commercial seafood to packing, to distribution, uh, folks catching the fish on the water, people in food service that, that deal with, um, the testing of the meat and such, you know, across the board, um, people in school service to make sure that, you know, we have to, we feed our children things that are FDA approved or, you know, USDA and such. Um, and so the, um, one thing I've been hearing is that there's a difference between what they do with the belly meat and the filet. Uh, so the belly meat is going to retain more of the toxins and, and heavy metals and things that you don't want to eat, just like it would do in a, like a Toro or a, or a tuna belly, uh, salmon. That's really fatty. That's where the, a lot of the things will be retained in the fats and the skin. Um, so I would say generally speaking, just from what I've, I've seen out there and being kind of a, a, a you know, I love to cook fish. Um, I think is what you really want to do is bleed your fish, um, those pieces of, of the upper filet are going to be probably better than the belly meat. Um, they actually produce a, um, uh, a catfish nugget out of the, at the belly meat available, um, commercially. So, um, uh, anyway, so the, there's some things you can do to kind of mitigate the impact. Um, some of the, the, the bloodline, the, the red, you know, meat that turns brown when you cook it, some of that can retain a little bit more stuff. Yeah, that's true on any fish. Yeah. Yeah. Any fish. Yeah. So, and that's the thing. It's, it's, it's a little bit different depending where it lives and where it grew up, et cetera. Um, and, but, but these fish are, are definitely um, up to a certain size, pretty edible. Um, I've been talking with the group that I've been working with about things we can do to advance our knowledge on this, um, especially with the fish that's so widely available in areas that may have chemical issues and seafood advisories. Um, you know, we find that, especially like take Washington DC and Baltimore, these urban centers that we know have a history of polluting the rivers and all these impacts that they have from the, the population density and then heavy metals, et cetera. Um, you take a, a lot of different shoreline access to a lot of different people. And so think about that dense population of people in, in, in uh, you know, waters in trouble. Uh, I can't think of the right term for that. Um, and eating fish out of those waters. And, you know, it's important to make sure we communicate with all anglers, but especially anglers there in those situations where they understand that what they're feeding their family might not be good for them. And, um, so we, well, we know, we know that like, if you're under 30, you're safe. Oh, right? yeah, that's yeah, good. Yeah. That's a, that's a I great think, start to so, so, that's a short answer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, well, well, let's, let's try and address Zach's question directly. I mean, let's say you get a 40 incher. Yeah. It's an invasive species. I don't know about you, but I, I feel, and I certainly suspect most folks watching this probably feel that you don't want to like just kill a fish and let it go to waste. I mean, what are you supposed to do? It's tough. And it's, I think it's a personal choice at this point. What can people do? Um, you know, there's plenty of most sportsmen out there have that, that moral challenge or, you know, they always, yeah. you, know, you eat you know, whatever you're going to, you take out uh, off the earth or out of the waters, you're going to eat, you're going to use for, for your benefit. Um, you know, fish are, they can be used to, to fertilize, um, that kind of thing. Um, I think that is a use that that's, if it's okay with you, it's, it's something you can do. Um, you can only put so many fish in your, your home garden, um, you know, to fertilize and grow some crops. But I, I know some folks that do that. I know folks that do that with, with fish carcasses that they're going to eat anyway, you know, what's left over, um, you know, crab bait, that kind of stuff, you know, that's kind of an option maybe, but it really comes up to the individual angler. And unfortunately, because of the stuff I was just talking about and, and the impact, you know, you don't want to eat these fish. There is that big dilemma because they eat a lot. Yeah. That, that's a tough call. Reproduce. And I don't think anybody has the answer. It's going to evolve <clears throat> as we kind of maybe find other options. I think, um, uh, even re reducing these fish, um, for a product like fertilizer on a commercial scale, it's probably not cost effective, but it might be worth it. And I, I, I hope there's some folks focusing on that kind of rendering down of, of the animals that we can't eat. Well, you know, it, it is truly a tough call. And this, this people is probably the one and only time you'll ever hear me say this, but maybe it's not best when you want to take home some blue cats to eat, to fish for the biggest fish possible. Get I those would, little ones. You, you're not going to hear me say catch the little ones very often. See, and I would argue, uh, I was actually, you know, on our podcast last night live with Sean Kimbrough, and he and I were talking about this a little bit. You know, to me, the smaller fish are always the best to eat. There's a tradition in Maryland before limits of pan rock, and it was for a reason. They taste great. I saw 
folks talking about eating largemouth the other day and the 12 to 13 inch range is the, the sweet spot. So, you know, they are. I, mean, I don't like to eat rockfish over about 26 inches. Yep. 20, kind 22, of, 24 is like, yeah. I feel like where you, it's worth it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Chris, do we have any other questions popping up? Are there any non-native crustaceans or plants in the bay? Now, Dave knows more about this than I do, but before he says anything, I'm going to guess more than we can count. Yeah. And I don't, honestly, I don't know the crustaceans and plant stuff very well. I know from a fish perspective, um, I'm glad you used the term non-native. Uh, we have some information about that on the count website um, because non-native is a thing. It's not native. It's pretty intuitive, right? Invasive is kind of a different level where it's um, it causes harm. Um, and so it's not just a term that's being thrown around because somebody added that to these these fish. Uh, the difference between the two is is one example of it is um, largemouth bass. They're not native to the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, they're native to the Ohio and you know the mid-continent drainage, Mississippi. Um, I was told that, uh, I think it was Joe Love at Maryland DNR told me that um, largemouth bass were largely spread across the country in the late 1800s, kind of post-Civil War um, as a food fish. Uh, play, uh, you know, a fish that can handle lots of different um, freshwater environments. So um, they're non-native. Uh, there's a couple of the catfish, I think, that are non-native beyond the the two that are invasive. Um, I can't think of too much well, off the top of my head, but it's common. And, you know, look in your backyard. There's tons of stuff probably planted that's non-native as well. Is it invasive? That's kind of up to the scientists and the biologists to determine based on the metrics they use. Again, it's not really shooting from the hip. They're looking at looking at it objectively. Uh, and trying to figure out, um, you know, with, in a scientific way, what is the line between you know, good and bad? Another tough call. It is. It is. Well, and I'll say that it goes back to the whole question of uh, what we're trying to answer here with data is give DNR a little bit more information to work with to make these decisions. How tolerant are snakeheads to salt water? Well, Robert, I'll tell you this. Much to my surprise, I know that a snakehead was pulled out of a crab pot in Ramsey yesterday. Ramsey is at the very mouth of the South River. It's as far down, as close to the open bay as you can get pretty much. I wouldn't call it high salinity, but it's a lot more than I would have thought they could take. I mean, these fish can clearly take a surprising amount of salinity. Yeah. And I, I don't know if everybody knows that you, know, you were talking about earlier where there's a balloon on the western shore, main stem of the bay, eastern shore, cleaner, clearer water for David. and um, that's a dynamic that plays out in the Chesapeake quite often. It's partly due to the, the spinning of the earth. The rotation of the earth pushes the incoming tidal water to the east side of the bay. So the east side of the bay is saltier. Uh, the west side of the bay is the fresh. So it, you're going to get these – there's all these seams and stuff that we don't even think about. Um, if, you know, as we If you get really obsessed with, like, high-tech electronics and some of the great monitoring stuff DNR has on the website, like the click to before you cast stuff, that can help you better understand the layers of water that might exist, the different – uh, salinities that are in them. And so I think these fish, what can they handle? I don't know. I'm not a biologist, but I, I'll tell you two two things I've heard of. Uh, one thing I've heard of recently and one thing I personally experienced. Um, I think just last week, somebody netted a snakehead that was cruising on the surface right by the Bay Bridge, right? Yeah. I, I think it was the west side of the bridge. I, I, you know, I'm assuming that water's a little fresher than not, um, at least in the, in the Bay mm. range. And then the fish was on the top and evidently kind of floundering. So Maybe it was kind of dealing with the physiological impact of the salinity on it. Um, my personal experience that I had one time was, uh, I think it was right right about this time of year, um, trying to catch a, a speck or two and a couple of rockfish. I was fishing the shallows or the point right at Bishop's Head, uh, right outside like Fish uh, Phillips Gunning Club, uh, the CBF facility down there. Uh, There's actually an osprey pole. I think they even had a name for it writ uh, written on it in paint. And I'm casting, standing on the bow of my boat you know, 50 yards off the bank. And I looked down and I literally said to my dad, look at this thing. What is that? And I just couldn't figure it out. And it was this black. And I, I described it as like a swimming Argyle sock. And it was the first one I'd seen in person. You know, it, it was, you know, five, six years ago, something like that. But right there, uh, you know, a really clear water, five to six feet of water, you know, seagrass starting to emerge, salty water. Um, and I just couldn't believe it. But not far from black water, um, you know, the salt, the fresh boundary right there, um, in that lower fishing bay area all the way up into Blackwater is a short little zone um, you know, compared to a lot of other places in the bay. So I think they're pretty darn tolerant. And I think in 2018, uh, with the freshet and the record rains, 
you know, that definitely led to a lot of the spread, especially of blue cats, um, for sure, of snakeheads. But a lot of snakeheads have traveled around this state in a bucket. And in the talons of osprey. That's true. That's it's another true. one. The osprey pick them up, and they fly around, yeah. and sometimes they lose their meal, and those snakeheads are rugged. They, they, they can have an experience like that and survive it just fine. I know that I have cut the gills out of snakehead, put them in the cooler, had them in there for six, seven hours, going home at the end of the day, and they're still kicking. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what do we got here? Will rigs work well around? Um, I, Dave, you want to address that? or? Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of repeat a lot of what I see a lot of top-notch anglers um, doing out there. And I will say the warm-up right now, you're going to have these fish becoming more active. Um, I know that there's been some uh, spawning activity. They kind of create a little bed, uh, or I can't think of the exact term, but they'll, they'll kind of dig into an embankment and almost make a little cave uh, for their spawning activities. And I think some of that's happening. And um, in fact, I think about this time <clears throat> last year, we, we were already seeing some fry balls. Um, but as far as working around timber, heavy cover, uh, a frog, is great there, there's some great little rubberized fro rubber frogs tons of different brands where the hooks come up and are somewhat protected you can lose them i lost one actually fishing on the side of the road two weeks ago um but um any kind of um weighted worm hooks where you can bury the hook into your into your swim bait um on the on the back end of maybe a buzz blade i like an inline buzz buzz bait um that kind of helps kind of power everything through um, I tie directly with braid directly to, to any topwater lures I'm using. And that way I just have a nice strong uh, strength to try and pull things off through heavy cover. Um, in fact, some of the, the most of the snakeheads I've caught have been in lily pads, uh, kind of on a falling tide, um, where I fish a lot of the, with a, with a, um, with a swim bait plastic into it on a, on a worm hook um, work really well for me. Um, I see a lot of guys, you know, in the open water throwing MEP spinners, uh, storm shads, you know, a jig head with a, with a paddle tail swim bait. Um, obviously that stuff's not going to work very well on the cover. Well, now that's something that I've seen popping up in a lot of the reports and I've seen Eric Packard apply quite a bit. Mm -hmm. He'll take the white fluke and ri rig it weedless. So yep. the hook is actually kind of buried in the plastic and he will throw that thing inside of branches, brambles, puffs of weed, I mean, you name it. And he can drag it through there and get it out pretty good. And that, that gets hit. Oh, yeah. And I thought I had a bait behind me. Yeah, I mean, these fish are, it's amazing where they can where they can hide and lay and be observant when you're out there looking for them. They're camouflaged um, for a reason. And it's because they hang around in places that are not very deep. Uh, I saw a picture last night um, on one of the pages where the guy said he'd been fishing for quite some time and looked down and there, there was one standing there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I caught one jigging a rattle trap right along Key Wallace Drive at my feet and, and hooked a fish that was, I lost it. Uh, it, it the hook pulled and it rolled back in the water. But would have been my, my personal best uh, snake. I'm guessing like eight pounds. Literally just jigging. A, there was fry balls everywhere um, last summer and you know, jigging a rattle trap. I couldn't believe it. It was well, little tin hooks. And, you know, I do want to mention, because uh, Mike also asked about the current. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to mention uh this this is something that uh dave uh gosh last name begins with a c one of the bait boys guys i mean damien maybe it was Damien. Oh, no, no, you mean cornflower yes yes yeah. yeah yeah one of those guys who, who really like they're deep into the snake oh, they, the they really know what's going on he he said to me he said don't get discouraged if you know you're in a good spot and you don't get bit because these fish play the tide and I've come to realize he was absolutely right. You can you can be on those fish, and they won't necessarily bite. You might think it's barren water, and then the tide changes, and boom, they'll come on. And I'm not sure if there is a solid prediction of which tides are best. Right, I right. do know that uh, fishing in jug, on a high tide, those lily pads are in water, Right. As the tide falls, there's exposed land under there. There's there's the pad and there's mud. That that water's only you know six eight inches deep on a high tide. And the thing to do is you fish the edge of those pads as the tide falls. And those snakeheads, they're up there in that super shallow water roaming around. As that ground becomes exposed, they trickle out just like the tide. They trickle out. From around those pads so you definitely do want to keep 
tide in mind. Yeah, yeah. And definitely, I think, also, when you get those areas where, you know, just think about if you're that fish, what are you doing to ambush prey, either being pushed by the tide, which is something we're totally used to fishing all the tidal species in the bay. Um, you know, tide is a big factor. I think time of day, temperature, those things matter, too. Um, I haven't seen people talking about too much of correlation between moon phase and that kind of stuff, but it absolutely has to affect it. It affects all living things. Uh, you know, I've always been said if the moon's above you or been told if the moon's above you or below you, that's when living things on Earth are the most active. And I haven't really kept a logbook to figure out if I, I'm restless on, you know, the when the moon's <laughs> above this guy, above me. But um, I've noticed that with, you know, things like bill fishing. You get a high moon all night long, the fish rest in the morning, and then they'll start biting again in the afternoon, probably when that moon's on the other side of the Earth. And uh, so I think all those little things are things people should observe. And I mean, today, in this day and age, we have so much technology right in our hand that can tell us all that stuff. Uh, and in fact, I angler can give you an option of, of kind of keeping a, keeping track of your catch. Um, iAngler has a non-tournament app uh, that mm -hmm. acts as an electronic logbook. Um, so if you're that kind of angler that wants to use some technology to keep track of these things and look back on it years from now, you might be able to start to see these patterns for yourself and, and teach us something. Um, so I, I will say the one thing about um, lily pads, beat the heck out of them, uh, you know, phone cast, <laughs> just keep going, keep going. Cause these fish are aggressive, but like we're talking about, they're not, feeding all the time uh so don't be afraid afraid to try and trigger that bite especially on the fry balls they're generally both fish are going to guard the fry balls um and if you can really irritate them and feel like right on top of it, they're being they're being uh you know threatened they're fry they're going to get aggressive after your bait regardless of a, a food instinct right it's a protection instinct mm -hmm. uh, so don't be afraid to really really cast the heck out of that uh test your patience and uh, see if you can't beat those fish cool Oh, we got another one from Jonathan here. What's a good strategy for targeting blue cats running a boat out of Herring Bay? Where to go catch them? Here to catch. So Herring Bay is a little bit far down for them. Now I caught one, uh, I guess maybe ten days ago, right off of Thomas Point, which isn't all that far from Herring Bay. Now if you ran. Ooh, well, you certainly wouldn't want to run way up the Patuxent. Uh, what do you think, Dave? What's you know, I think I think um, they're probably catchable, both blue cats and snakeheads, in in most of the Anne Arundel County rivers. Um, I know folks are definitely getting up to you know Sandy Point area, and that's far. Um, yeah, that's where above the bridge is is kind of where the the vast majority. Hear about some from Hackett's. Yeah, yeah, and it's all going to depend on our rain and and where the salinity lines are and stuff. Yeah. Um, that western shore is probably going to be more likely than the eastern shore. And, and going up in the south, going up in the Severn, the west, um, I think those are all, again, there's still a little bit of a run, depending on, you know, what kind of vessel you're in. But uh, I think it's a good good shot. And go go diversified and ready to catch a couple different things. And then when the peelers are going and get out there and catch some perch, uh, you know, target a rockfish. Uh, you, you know, something else that goes through my head, Herring Bay. I'd try running up that creek and fishing around that bridge. That's a good point. I, I would bet money. Yep. There's catfish up up in there because they're like you said the freshet in 2017 18 they scatter they go pretty much everywhere if they went up that creek which I mean how could they not they must have to some degree they probably in all likelihood got stuck up there and wherever you have a bridge normally you've got some kind of channel going in the middle I, I'd go up near that I would I'd seriously give that a shot I will bet there are cats up there. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've been surprised by uh, what's been reported. You know, the locations, I, if I didn't say it earlier, we do not provide them out to the public. Yeah, I get to see them, but I'm passing them along the DNR um, and really just understand where these fish are. There's no real secrets out there. Well, I'll be texting you later. <laughs> no, no, I'm not bribable. Um, so, you know, we're not giving that information out, but um, to me, it's intriguing to see these fish pop up in, in places. And honestly, I haven't seen any in that area um, south of the bridge west side reported yet. I'm sure there have been some reports on online. Um, definitely in the Severn, for sure. Um, yeah, the South, too. They're, they're in the South. Yeah. For sure. Yep. You mentioned crab pots. Any reports? Do we mean any reports on crabs there? Is that what you're going for there, Tim? I'm not sure if you mean uh, the crab pots. was. That's what the snakehead was in. There were no crabs in that crab pot. <laughs> <laughs> they are just starting. Everything I'm hearing is they are just starting. 
I would be, I would have tried trot lining by now, uh, but my, my boat is not quite finished yet. It's been worked on uh, for the last few months and it's not quite ready yet. And I was actually thinking to myself, I wonder if I'll be able to go crabbing this weekend, but I, I haven't heard anything yet. I'm waiting. But uh, yeah, they're just getting started. Just getting started. Yeah, I will say I'm, I haven't heard anything yet, but um, I'm allergic to the little critters, which is uh, depressing. You crabs? Depressing as a, a yeah, native. Uh, I, went through a, I went through a period where I took Benadryl and ate them, and I would take a great nap, you know, after maybe a six pack. It was probably stupid, but in fact, after talking to a doctor, they said, "Yeah, just quit. Don't don't eat crabs anymore. I know they're good." Uh, so anyway, that's, fun fact. That's trivia for a later day. Oh, oh! I feel horrible for you, Dave. It's depressing. I, the, well, the worst part is I've eaten them so much, and you know, it, the last time I ate them, I had them five times uh, in the summertime. The first bu uh, two bushels I I got uh, for a friend's cookout Memorial Day weekend were crab scrape scrape crabs from Smith Island, which are great. You know, they haven't been eaten on a bait. They're nice and clean. They're fresh out of the, out of the bottom, getting out into the grasses. Um, great crabs. Had them like four more times, different you know, sources, uh, throughout the, throughout the summer. And the last time I ate one crab, I thought it was, I thought it was going to be over. Mm. So don't, don't mess with allergies folks. Wow. Yeah. It's depressing, especially the soft crab. <sighs> All right. Charles is asking, what is the best place to install an inline weight or an umbrella rig and how much leader do you use? Now, first thing I'm going to say is without any question, if you talk to 10 different anglers, they will give you 10 different answers. <laughs> that is a fact on the answer to that question. I've seen it all different kinds of ways. I'll tell you what I do. And I'm not a huge troller, but through the years, I've done plenty of trolling for rockfish, including with umbrellas. And honestly, I'll take that uh, cigar sinker, put a swivel clip on either end, and clip it directly to the front of the umbrella rig. And then clip the line to the other end. I personally don't believe that you need six inches a foot, 10 feet in between, nothing. Put that way right on the front of the umbrella. See if you don't agree with me. Now, there are guys who say, oh, no, you got to put a 10 feet up the line. You got to put a 15 feet up the line. I'm telling you, I don't think it makes a dang bit of difference. Dave, you got a, a theory on this? I don't. I, I'll tell you, there's... So many great anglers out there. I'd love to see somebody in the comments provide some input. But I will tell you, I agree with that. Ten anglers, ten uh, opinions. I've actually oh, yeah. say that yeah, if you if you quiz ten anglers, you might get twenty opinions. Oh yeah, look at Jesse, Jonathan coming in and saying everyone has a different preference. It's totally <laughs> true. It's totally, <laughs> totally, totally true. Yeah. But but I'm telling you, I I go straight to the umbrella on the on the occasions that I do troll. And that's even though I'm not a troller today. I mean, when I was in my 20s, my 30s, you know, we, we used to do it all the time. I've actually, I think, bought and sold full complements of trophy trolling gear at least three times in my life. <laughs> you know, I, I use it for X amount of time and I'm like, oh, I'm not doing that anymore. And I get rid of it. And then five years later, I buy it again. But anyway, um, I've never been able to tell a darn bit of difference. I, I truly don't think it makes an iota of difference. Yeah, no, it. I'll tell you, most of my uh, most of my offshore experience, or most of my trolling experience, has been offshore, and I, and I I love fishing no matter how I fish. Period. But I got to the point where fishing in the bay, I figured out I'd drink too much beer while trolling, and you know, become useless by the end of the day. I'm fishing offshore. I used to fish with a bunch of guys that loved to drink beer, and they knew I didn't drink beer offshore. It's just you know, too much going on. And uh, so I'd always be the guy driving the boat in, and uh, that was a lot of surface stuff, you know, not umbrellas. The umbrellas we used to pull. Mm -hmm dredges which incidentally you put the weight way right in front of it's true just Very say good. yeah mm -hmm. oh my oh, chris yeah. where are we at here so i'm i'm just coming back because um we don't have any more questions but allison marie um she uh heard our earlier question about uh invasive crustaceans and plants and i thought hey she knows or at least yeah, she commented. So, so. The mitten crabs I remember hearing about. Now the green crab, that's an interesting one because that is like the most popular tog bait around, right? <laughs> Everybody uses green crab. I wonder, and Allison, if you know, please chime in. I wonder if that's how they got there, bringing them in as bait. Well, that is that is Dr. Allison Colton uh, from CBF. 
Oh, so, I didn't see a code on the head. Yes, we are dealing with a uh, fisheries <laughs> a PhD oyster scientist right here. She's the one who will know. <laughs> I figured she knew what she was talking about. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, cool. Um, I'm just I'm just reviewing, going through the comments, um, and I don't see a heck. Kevin's got a comment. Hey, Kevin. And another I'm opinion on the on back it. of the umbrella. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's so that's right on, right on it. So anyhow, um, well, and and we're just about out of time anyway. So well, that's um, pretty good timing, then, Chris. Chris always times it perfectly. As long as there's not a technical disaster. Yeah, oh, God. And thank goodness we didn't have that disaster today. Uh oh. <laughs> Allison just commented, don't give away my identity. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You've the been out already circling. They know where you live. <laughs> I, I'm curious now. I want to know if the green crabs got here as bait because we do use them as bait all the time. I mean, everybody uses them as bait all the time. And there is a different, similar crab. I'm not aware of the name. I'm sure she could tell us. You might. I don't know if it's, okay, interesting. You know, but, who I bet, you know who I bet knows is uh, Captain Monty. He might. He might. And he that's the, what you what you normally would call like a white crab or a white legger. I'm sure that's not the right name, but that's mm -hmm. you know what you got. That that's a native crab that is used for the tog bait. So yeah, yeah, they're the ones that are usually harder harder to get, and you got to kind of buy them special or pay more. for Yeah, them. they're more expensive. But Monty has them. Yeah, Monty has them. So we got one last question. I'm going to just bring it up because I Pop think it on up there. How to humanely prepare the catfish? Ooh, well, that's a good question. So I will tell you, I think um, I've been when I was fishing more and handling more fish and uh, and humanely putting them putting them in the cooler. Um, there's a couple different things I like to do. Um, maybe not catfish, but the more oily fish like bluefish, Spanish mackerel. Um, I definitely like to bleed them, cut the spinal cord. At that point, what you any kind of nerve passage, the brain and the and the rest of the body is disconnected. Uh, anything else is just going to be muscle memory kind of things and twitching. Um, and I think that's the same principle behind the Ikajimi method, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right. And that's where you're putting like a a, a spike into the brain, um, and then you, even folks uh, will bleed and then also um, place monofilament down the spine, I think, to properly do that method. And there's some interesting information out there on that because it it's a whole thing of, of what happens to the animal when it dies and, and how the different things happen to lead towards like rigor mortis, et cetera. Um, and, and there's a lot of science behind it. And I think that's a really good way where I've seen people do blind taste tests of, um, of raw and cooked fish properly done with Ikajimi and clearly said, oh my gosh, this is a much better meat quality. And the thing I do with the oily fish, other than separating the spine and the and the gills and the um, you know, the, the nervous system, is is also I like to use a, a nice high performance cooler, like an like an angle cooler, um, pack it full of salt, salt brine, and get these fish cold really quickly too. Because that's gonna to me, it's just a good way to keep that meat fresh. Um, and and the salt ice you can get down below thirty two degrees. And uh, we're actually going to be doing some really cool stuff with um, processing some of these fish later throughout the summer as we get moving with the invasives count some more. Uh, we're going to be doing some, um, some hopefully some electro fishing. I haven't nailed that down completely yet, but some bow fishing and some sampling on that, some videos and some information, um, how to how to break these fish down, how to clean them properly, what to look for. Um, there's parasites in some fish meat. You know, we want to be cautious of that. Um, tips on how you cook it, et cetera. And, yeah, and Kevin said a nice pick to the brain is, is a great way to quickly dispatch them. And that's definitely part of the Ikijimi, uh, Ikijime, um philosophy. Yeah, I thought it was a good question. I, th I think you can Google it and find a you know, YouTube video on how to. Yeah. Wait, could you spell it for us, please? How do you spell that? I K I G, no, no, I K E G I M E is what I believe. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed. Yeah, I'm going to Google it. As my two-year-old tries to break into my office. Let me Google that for you. Well, you, are you Googling? We're going to wait for you to Google it? I am. Okay. There you go. I'll find, I just found the Wikipedia link, and I'll put it in the comments here. Oh, Ooh. I comment. I think you have to, Chris, but um, uh, it's I-K-E-J-I-M-E, -E, and, uh, and there's lots of great information on that. I, I recommend folks giving that a try to all fish. I mean, I think we have a yeah. lot. We mistreat uh, some of our harvest sometimes, and it affects it affects the flavor on the dinner plate. And I think folks need to take take advantage of these small things you can do to make a much better meal for yourself. 
I agree. I don't do the whole spiel. There is a there is a whole process there. But if you just take a fillet knife and go right in the top of the head and give the wiggle till the fish shivers, you can dispatch it quickly and you don't have to worry about it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, not being able to breathe and asphyxiating to death. Right. Which always is kind of a bummer. Yep. 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 It absolutely is. Yeah. Uh, hold on one second. I there we go. Oh, there we go. There it is. Um, yeah, actually, it's, it's interesting. I, I actually remember watching this at one time, and uh, I, it's true. I the what they talk about with the taste testing and all of that. They said it's as I think quite amazing. So, if you're a sushi fan, I think you should also know this. So, um, okay, uh, let's see if we got anything left. Uh, Jonathan's got another question. So here we go. Oh. Do you think the majority, the large majority of breeder fish migrated south during April before the trevor season? Jonathan, I think the answer to that is almost certainly yes. However, you're dealing with a much smaller population of breeder fish in the first place. So not only did most of them leave the bay before the season ever opened, there were a lot fewer of them to leave in the first place. That, that's kind of, that's where we're at these days. I'm sure Dave could expand on that probably until about 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> this, this is a big issue. I mean, this is the issue, right? This, yeah. this is the issue. Yeah, it is. And there's you know, there's a major disconnect between um, what, sorry if you can hear a baby crying. He's <laughs> trying to break in. Um, so there's a major disconnect between what, what our scientific models say and assume and estimate about our populations and what we experience on the water. Um, a lot of the surveys that happen of these spawning fish, I haven't seen the results of or talked to the biologists, but there are some uh, drift gill net surveys that happen in various parts of the Chesapeake to understand or to tag some of these big female fish uh, on the spawning grounds. And so um, I know Beth Versack is one of the leads of that that program at Maryland DNR. And you know, I think we should we maybe try and talk with her soon and get an idea of what they experienced in some of the rivers versus what anglers did. Um, cause that, that'll be really helpful in trying to understand at least, you know, the Maryland perspective of what's happening with these, these breeding fish, the population's down. The most recent stock assessment kind of scaled up the actual number of fish that are estimated to be in the population. But the, the bottom line is there's, um, regardless of an estimate of more fish, the population is down, like Lenny said, and I think people's fishing experiences the last many years, uh, have experienced, uh, have, you know, re um, reflected that. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. And just for the record, I'll point out. My gosh, you know, this year there was no April fishing. Um, but historically, if you go back to guys who were pre-fishing, yep. the couple of weeks before the season came in in mid-April, they were doing great, like five years running. Yep. So there were, the fish were moving around, you know. It, it was already, I would say, relatively late in the game when the season started. And that was a good thing, yep. right? We want to let these fish get up there and do their thing and make lots of babies before we even think about catching it. I mean, it's, you know, clearly. Yeah, and, and wearing my, uh, always, always wearing my what's right for the fish hat. Uh, the reality is um, we have to look hard at, at what happened in our winter net, winter gill net fishery here in Maryland. I'm interested in looking at some of the harvest information on that. The The commercial quotas and, or the commercial markets were impacted by COVID for sure. So I think all Bay jurisdictions kind of undershot their potential harvest. That's good for the fish. But there's also this uh, Virginia winter gillnet fishery where they're anchored gillnets with a seven inch mesh size. Uh, I think their quota in that fishery or their broader commercial fishery is something like just shy of a million pounds. Maryland's 1.44 million pounds, but we caught about a million last year. Uh, the Potomac as well, I can't remember the numbers, but they have a pretty robust commercial fishery too. And the management plan doesn't look at that on a detailed level to understand what fish are really being impacted. But we know for sure that uh, that that the Virginia anchored gillnet fishery is whacking these fish on the way in. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see a lot of changes happen about how we treat these fish across all sectors. I don't care what the excuses are. We've waited way too long to uh, to do what's right by these big fish. And I understand the desire to harvest one. I can't understand eating them. I've eaten one too many of them and don't don't like the way it tastes personally. But, the, you know, I, I respect people's uh, wishes to do what they want to do within the law. That's what uh, makes us all equal, um, you know, in the eyes of the law. And, uh, you know, the CCA is heavily involved in fisheries. I'm, I'm obviously um, I'm honored to, to represent recreational anglers and conservation and, and, frankly, the state of Maryland at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, but please don't, don't ever think that Maryland couldn't be more proactive. Potomac, Virginia, they made choices recently to 
to place the, the conservation measures on recreational anglers and on uh, the least reliable cuts. Um, you know, the summertime closure, the April closure of the flats. I'm not very confident we're saving a lot of fish here, but we're keeping these quotas the same. So um, on commercial, so there's a lot of work to be done. There's some cuts to be done. There's trains on the tracks and, and we all better cross our fingers that a lot of baby rockfish get born and survive multiple years in a row, or it's going to be quite some time before we see the good fisheries that we've been able to experience over the last 20 years. So time to pay the piper. We've been having our cake and eating it too. Uh, thanks. I see there's a question up on, up on the screen here, and I'm not going to talk until 10 o'clock. That was it on straight <laughs> off, unless there's another question. Um, yes, CCA does have a YouTube channel. Um, it should be at CCA Maryland. Um, if not, our Facebook's CCA Maryland, and I think there's a link there, uh, and it's also on our website. Um, so we've been doing our What's on the Line podcast uh, once a month right now through the YouTube channel. Um, you'll also see we live stream many things, like, very similar things like this. There it is. Look at that. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, and so the um, we're just getting going with some of our YouTube stuff, and you're going to see a lot more on invasives, like I mentioned, now that things are opening up with the pandemic. Uh, we're going to hit the road. And, and if anybody out there um, you know, wants to uh, – Give me a shout to talk about straight bass stuff, uh, more about CCA. My information's on our website, uh, you know, ccamd.org. And um, I'm really interested in folks' experiences on the water with rockfish, especially as the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission focuses on trying to shape the future of management. Um, but we need to realize that, again, it's going to take a while before those regulations hit the bay. And I think we all need to start looking at DNR to, to take some proactive action because they surely have not recently. Um, and you know, anyway, so I'm always out there and, and with the invasives count, if there's some things you want to highlight in the community, good people doing good things, techniques, tackle, that kind of stuff. You know, we ask folks to participate for free, but if you want to be a promotional partner, just like Island Tackle, uh, Blackwater's Edge and the Wolford store, we've got a lot more promotional partners coming, some great things to give away, uh, some great information out there. So come one, come all. It's meant to be a big tent where we learn from each other. Um, we all need to respect each other's interests and, and uh, desires to participate in these fisheries in different ways. Um, and that's what we're here to do. You know, we're a big community and let's, uh, let's figure out a way to work together and make things better than we found them. You know, Dave, I'd like to win like maybe a 26, 28 foot center console. Could you get one of those in the prize mix, please? Hmm. Let me call our good friends in Florida. They seem to have really, really good connections. Like to twin, boat companies. twin 300s maybe on it. Yeah, no, good prize. Let me make a call right now. Okay. No, but I'll tell you one cool prize I just ordered today. See that copper fish? I do. So Lenny has a copper fish on his wall. I do. It's up there. Yes, it is a pickerel, and it was a prize from our pickerel tournament from the winter. Congratulations. Thank you. We are. Uh, we just ordered some snakehead copper fish, and that's for the Blackwater's Edge, the series. Uh, we're the snakehead angler of the year sponsor for that and um and the, the invasives count is um i ordered a second one and i'm not sure what i'm gonna do with it yet but i'm pretty sure a lucky snakehead angler or invasives count angler may, may be in the running for that Ooh. i'm also gonna have some good stuff on catfish don't worry um i don't know if the copper catfish is as cool as the snakehead but hey i want to hear from people um you know we want to work with with all sorts of folks in our industry like i said to provide some really cool prizes there's a Traeger grill in the works uh, coming up soon. Um, nice. Yeah, good plan. So hang tight and sign up. It's free, you know? Cool. Awesome. Uh, and, you know, the copper fish is also a good investment. The price of copper is skyrocketing. Well, you know what's funny? There's a, uh, there's a, there's actually a penny back here. So it's at least worth a penny, whatever. Oh, that's nice. They, they, they hang around. I like, I like what you've done there. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm calling it. Yeah. Um, I got things to do, damn it. No, this yeah. was great. I, I really appreciate everybody tuning in, um, uh, especially in our, not our normal night, but actually returning after our debacle. Um, special thanks to, to Dave, not only for showing up twice, but also for giving us this new platform to deal with, which seems to be working really nicely. So thank you again, Dave. Appreciate that. Chris, I have a secret. I was logged on yesterday. <laughs> uh oh. I went, uh, it's on my calendar for Tuesday. <laughs> you know, so I've logged on three times now. It's just my, you know, the point I'm making. Okay, cool. Um, I hope my camera wasn't on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why, well, I mean, Chris's living room. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you again. We'll have another live with Lenny um, next month or. Sometime soon. First, first Thursday of the month. 
month first in Thursday. June. We got yeah. We got first our, Thursday of the month in June at five o'clock. All right. We're we'll sticking to our schedule. We don't know what the we don't know what the topic is yet. I do not have a topic yet, but I can tell you it's going to be cool. Of course. When, you oh my! June third is the first Thursday of the month. June third. Yeah. We can yeah. do that. It's going to be cool. All right. That's, All right. The, that's the guarantee. It's going to be cool. Well, that's the night of our uh, captain's meeting for the Kent Narrows Flying Light Tackle Tournament. So. Oh, my. So you're all going to be watching it online. That's right. Really we'll cool. watch live at Le live with Lenny right on the big screen. <laughs> on tackle. We'll talk about eye angler and talk about rockfish for a bit. Oh, and there's a copper white perch. There's a copper white perch in the Chesapeake Light Tackle Perch Division in the, in the uh, Kent Narrows Tournament. So. Nice. So, well, lots of great ways to get some cool wall art and uh, just for catching a fish. Cool. All right, everybody. Have a good evening. Get on the water. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.